we today are going to look at a theme that is across many of the prophets, and it's really an important backdrop understanding to what the prophets are and what message they are coming to proclaim. It's all about the relationship between God and his people. There's an attempt here by the prophets to stir the people to restore their relationship with God. There's a motif called the covenant lawsuit. That's what we're going to look at today. So here we go. So let me read here from Victor Matthews to kind of frame this up a little bit. Micah cast his denunciation of Jerusalem and Samaria, the capital cities, remember, and their leadership in the form of a divine lawsuit. Micah points more specifically to the urban centers as the cause of the people's despair and destruction. And so this theme of the covenant lawsuit, like what is this all about? Well, if you remember the story of the people of Israel, they were rescued from slavery in Egypt and God invited them into a covenant relationship in Exodus chapter 19. And that covenant is is throughout the book of Exodus, the rest of Exodus, and then it's explicitly restated for the people going into the promised land in kind of the whole book of Deuteronomy as this covenant document. And as part of this covenant, it's like a marriage, right? That they were going to be an exclusive relationship with God. And through that exclusive relationship with God, they would be able to participate in God's redemptive uh, intent and his mission to the rest of the world. That was the idea. But as we know, as we read the book of Judges, as we read the history of the kings, as we read uh, these, these really challenging sections of history, as we've slid into the particular period that Micah is prophesying in, we understand that people are not living up to God's covenant. They're not exclusive with him. That couple needs uh, legal remediation. This is the backdrop to understanding what is God doing here. Now, I do want to mention something, that God's kind of justice, God's kind of exercise of his own rights and expectations with his people, he always carries out in a restorative way. So I want that, we're going to circle back to that at the end of this Devo, but here we go, the covenant motif. Let's read a little bit of this text and we'll dive into the specific accusations that have been stretched across this book. We're reading Micah chapter 6. Listen to what the Lord says. Stand up. Plead my case before the mountains. Let the hills hear what you have to say. Hear, you mountains, the Lord's accusation. Listen, you everlasting foundations of the earth, for the Lord has a case against his people. He is lodging a charge against Israel. My people, what have I done to you? How have I burdened you? Answer me. I brought you up out of Egypt and redeemed you from the land of slavery. I sent Moses to lead you, also Aaron and Miriam, my people. Remember what Balak king of Moab plotted and what Balaam son of Beor answered? Remember your journey from Shittim to Gilgal, that you may know the righteous acts of the Lord. Just want to pause real quick here. This is recounting the story of the Exodus, Moses, Aaron, Miriam, and then also this scene as they're coming into the promised land. Balak had hired this prophet, Balaam. Uh, You can read this in the book of Numbers. Um, He meant them ill, and God uh, redeemed them through it. God has been caring for this people and bringing them and rescuing them. And and this is very relational to God. He's taking their disobedience, their their rebellion against him. They're leaving after other gods, their three-eyed monster, uh, injustice, infidelity, and idolatry. These things, uh, God's taking this very personally. All sin is personal to God, and thus he has a case. Here we transition to Micah's voice, kind of a rhetorical voice here. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with 10,000 rivers of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? As we will see that God himself actually offers this, but spoilers. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good. And what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God against these three eyes of injustice, idolatry, and infidelity to God? God's simply asking for these three corrective behaviors to act justly 
to love mercy and to walk humbly with God. Listen, the Lord is calling to the city, and to fear your name is wisdom. Heed the rod and the one who appointed it. Am I still to forget your ill-gotten treasures, you wicked house? And the short ephah, which is accursed, shall I quit someone with dishonest scales, with a bag of false weights? As we'll dive into in just a minute, these are references to business practices that are designed to cheat people out of money. This is an injustice. Your rich people are violent. Your inhabitants are liars. Their tongues speak deceitfully. Therefore, I have begun to destroy you, to ruin you because of your sins. You will eat but not be satisfied. Your stomach will still be empty. You will store up but save nothing because what you save I will give to the sword. You will plant but not harvest. You will press olives but not use the oil. You will crush grapes but not drink the wine. You have observed the statutes of Omri and all the practices of Ahab's house. You have followed their traditions. Therefore, I will give you over to ruin and your people to derision. You will bear the scorn of the nations. This is a reference here to the northern kingdoms, and they were very idolatrous, very violent. They seized land from other people. They exercised a lot of injustice, and um, they gave their their country over to the worship of Baal. Um, You can read more about that in the books of the kings. And the idea, instead of being uh, a light to the nations, they're going to be the scorn of the nations. So, wow, this is tough. God's right in bringing them to court, to highlighting this. And I want to mention here that this prophetic rhetoric, as we've seen through the book of Jonah, again, a wonderful series to revisit. Check out our series on Jonah for more on Nineveh's repentance on this playlist. When God calls people to account, if they would respond, if they would say, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. God is so quick to restore his people at any sign of repentance. And that's not what we see among the people of Micah, as we'll get into just in our last Devo on this, the protest prophet. He ends with a lament that ends with hope. Um, But in the time being, this is the state of things. Let me just add a little bit of extra clarity to the kind of injustices that are going on, because this passage sheds lights on some, and we've we've gone through a few. But what is it that that God's so irritated, the, the actual things that are happening amid the rhetoric, amid the motifs, What's happening in in Jerusalem that God is so upset at? Well, let's just look at three examples. In Micah 2, 1 through 2, we see the predatory real estate practices. I'm going to quote here from uh, Victor Matthews, a commentator. He says, Large landowners and wealthy individuals prey upon small farmers, seizing their land for debt, squeezing them off their holdings, and depriving them of their covenantal inheritance. Predatory real estate practices. Well, America knows something about that, don't we? Check out the dehumanizing legacy of the doctrine of discovery. Another thing is happening, bribes and bad legal practices. Quoting Matthews again, the political leaders of Israel are unjust and corrupt. The officials and judges take bribes. Should we be able to bribe people for justice? No. Uh, America knows something about that too. You ever heard of lobbying? Is it really different than bribery? Even the experts say the distinction between the two can be opaque. Hmm corrupt business practices. Micah condemns corrupt business practices. In chapter 6, 11, we just read it about the weights and the scales and the short ephah. These are are ways to cheat people out of what they're paying for. Yeah, I was just watching the other day about how some companies have have changed their packaging. Uh, It looks like the same packaging, but there's actually less product in it. So if you look at the weight of the product, it's actually less, but it looks the same and you're paying the same amount for the that you used to pay. It's called shrinkflation, and it sucks. Feels a little bit like this. I don't mean to inadvertently suggest that this book was primarily written to our context. What I'm trying to provide is that the same kind of patterns, the same kind of participation in broken systems and injustice is commonplace today. And no, this text was not written to national America. This was written to Israel and this specific covenant that God is bringing them to court for. Uh, it's a national covenant that, that no other country has had. This is a special revelation, a special story for Israel. But what irritates God then irritates God now. 
And so as, as we realize the brokenness of the world around us and we wonder these things, I, I just don't want us to numb out or think that these words of Micah only applied to the context they're in, but it gives us a glimpse of the heart of God to see how people, particularly the poor, are being taken advantage of in this society and God sees it and he's angered by it. So if that's been you or you know someone who has been oppressed by uh, people in power, it is right to be frustrated about this. God took his people to court over it. However, again, just want to keep in mind, we have to consider ourselves a secondary audience uh, bearing witness to what's happening throughout this, the, the history of Israel and the, and the days in which Micah actually proclaimed this message. So these folks represent God, these people who are grabbing land, who are taking bribes, who are, you know, unfairly disadvantaging people in their business practices. Well, God's taken them to court for it. Here's the crazy thing about this covenant court motif, this case that God is building. God actually becomes our own defense prosecutor and defense lawyer. So bear with me, but the when Jesus refers to the Holy Spirit as the uh, counselor, um, uh, or the advocate, you've heard this, the paraclete is the word I'm using uh, from Greek. So skipping forward in salvation history, we know that God has, has given his spirit to us, and that spirit is doing something in our relationship with God within us. And this word paraclete can also be used of legal counsel. And so we see the idea that the Holy Spirit, you've heard this term, convicts us, right? It convicts us. It, it makes us feel like, oh, just like we read that stuff. And if I was doing all those practices, if the Holy Spirit is at work in my life and I'm allowing it to shape me, I would feel convicted. Oh man, I am not doing well with God. I'm not doing justice. I'm not loving mercy. I am not walking humbly with him. I feel convicted by the Holy Spirit. And and, and again, if this court motif is something in our understanding of our relationship, God, if it's a theme that helps us understand what's happening, God's actually our prosecution lawyer. And in the same stroke, we see Paul talk about this, uh, the Holy Spirit groaning inward within us. This idea of the advocate, the attorney, the paraclete is also our defense lawyer. And just as Micah rhetorically asked, if do you want my son? God himself gave up his son to, to make things right by him. And so I just want to say that in this covenant court context, and we understand the, co the covenant of Israel and, and, and the grand uh, themes of, of the biblical narrative and, and the significance of what happens at the cross and the death and the burial, the resurrection, the coming of the Holy Spirit, all this stuff, it's answers to the puzzles of how will people make right their relationship with God. And ultimately, just like Abraham's covenant with, with, with God back in, in Genesis chapter 17, where uh, I, I, it's a really fun text to read, but, but uh, there's this covenant of the pieces and they kind of split open these animals and and uh, it's supposed to be a way of like, kind of like an old, uh, a really, really old fashioned handshake of like, yep, we're on, we agree. Um, they, would, they would split animal carcasses and walk through them and essentially put it on themselves like, hey, if either of us break this promise, it's kind of a pinky promise, right? It's kind of a pinky promise. Um, if any of us break this promise, uh, may this happen to us, right? Maybe we split asunder. That's kind of the imagery here um, in this ancient uh, covenant concept, right? When you make a handshake or a pinky promise, it's like, hey, we're, we're for real about this. So Abraham does this and him and God are both gonna walk through, but God actually has Abraham fall asleep and God walks through twice. And what I wanna say about this is that all of this covenant curse that ends up heaped on the people that they can never fix their relationship with God. They can never walk in their way. God, in, he actually puts himself on the line, fulfills their end of the covenant as well so that we may put on Christ and walk freely in the grace accepted by the merciful love of God. And so uh, even in this courtroom, and the way that the, the that God interacts with his people and brings them to himself, I just want you to see the heart of God. 
how much he wants a relationship with his people, that he himself would take on the curse, that he himself would live out the covenant partner role and invite us into his life in doing so to restore the relationship that is at a troubled place. So I hope you see the heart of God in that. I hope you hear the hope we have as this story continues and as we look ahead towards Jesus. Let me just say this. I think this may be helpful because we just passed over a really significant verse that I want to reread again. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. So think of these as the cure for the three eyes, the antithesis to the, the things that are ripping them away from their relationship with God. Rather than injustice, act justly. Rather than infidelity, to God, love, his mercy, rather than enshrining idols, fake gods, whether that's ourselves or anything else, to fill that void, walk humbly with God. Amid this covenant court motif, I wanna ask this question and reflection. And if, if God's bringing an accusation against them, he's also setting forth the, the goal, the value, the way he actually wants them to be. And through Christ, he actually enables us to do these three things. Let's go to God in prayer. As you close this video, just spend some moments in, in silence. Would we pray for forgiveness for the times we don't do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly with our God?